Welcome to Flat Ride of the Week, episode 19. Today we'll be talking about the Byron Curve. Now, many native English speakers actually pronounce it quite differently than that, but that is how it's officially pronounced. Today we have a special guest, Luke, who is an assistant ride supervisor at Kennywood and has lots of experience working their Byron Curve. As always, if we forget anything or say something that's incorrect, please politely correct us in the comment section below. Let's get started. And let's get started with the history. So, the Bayenkuh's original concept was created by German engineer Anton Schwarzkopf. The first Bayenkuh style ride was built in 1964 and debuted it in 1965. It was called Tigehai and it had a roof construction, similar to what can be found on Music Express rides. Another difference from the Bayenkuh's is that the Tigehai had different trains. Instead of the inline seating the Bayenkuh's have, the Tigahai had two across seating, and just like the other Bayern curves, these trains had no restraints. The Tigahai traveled on the German fair circuit until around 1974. It is unknown where it went and where it is now. Two other Bayern curves were built with the Tigahai style train and roof construction. The second one was called Schlitten Express, traveled in Germany from 1966 until 1970. The third one was called Höhlen Taxi and it debuted in 1967. It traveled on a German fair circuit and, and later ended up at Bobby Anland and the French park Oké Corral, where it operated until around 2002. Then it was in storage until 2007 and then German showman Senk completely refurbished the ride. They removed the roof structure and they gave it a complete restyle and they gave back the Höhlen Taxi name. Eventually, in 2015, it was sold to an unknown buyer in Texas. And the first buying curve built with the trains with inline seating that we all know now, the most popular model, it debuted in 1965. A lot of these were built in the 60s and the 70s. Most of them were sold to traveling showmen in Europe and the US. The buying curve never really became popular in European parks but they did become very popular in US parks. For example, Cedar Point, Kings Island and Kennywood bought Byron Curves with the original backdrop and decorations. Some US parks like Magic Mountain and Carowinds opted to not have any decorations. Some Byron Curves were sold to US parks by Intamin, for example, the Swiss Bob 2 at Six Flags Great Adventure. Most buying curves were simply named Bayern Curve or Swiss Bob. About 49 Bayern curves were built, but sadly there's not much of them left. Four of them are still traveling, three in Europe and one in Mexico, and there's still two of them left at parks, one in Kennywood and one at California's Great America, but sadly that one is running very slow. And speaking of the one at Kennywood, we have someone who's very familiar with that specific ride with us now about to tell us about the operation of it. So go ahead, tell us about the operation of the uh, Byron Curve. The operation of the Byron Curve can vary from model to model, and depending on how the power is sent to the cars, may determine on how one would be operated. Uh, a Byron Curve model would usually come from the factory with smaller rails on the inside of the track that has a pickup trolley that feeds electric to the car motors and the lights. Now, at Kennywood, though, we don't actually have the uh, rail pickup on ours anymore. That was taken out due to the fact that uh, these pickups would have a tendency to get tangled up in the rails or even torn off. So that would mean that the cars would be unable to tilt up or down. For the Kennywood model, we actually have an in-house cone that feeds an electric signal through the uh, cable in the middle to the rails on the cars so they can get power to tilt. That means that the Kennywood model isn't able to have as many decorations on the inside, such as maybe you've seen the pole or the Olympic rings. I know for a fact, though, that the Kenwood model did come with the Olympic rings and actually lights that went around uh, the spectators. But the thing about that is due to the way it's set up to increase longevity of our, our barren curve, uh, those all had to be taken out. 
that's why most of the fairground models actually are able to have like the fountains, the posts with the spectators uh, bouncing up and down, and all of the extra lights and like the Olympic rings in the middle. Most Baron Curve models, though, have 16 bobsleighs holding two people in each car with a seatbelt as their only restraint. In these bobsleighs, the larger rider would be sitting in the back of the bobsleigh, while the smaller rider would be in between their legs. The setup of the curve consists of two stationary drive tires with compressed air brakes uh, attached to them. Depending on the model, these brakes can be controlled by a brakes button on the control panel, or in the case of the model at Kennywood, have a foot pedal on the ground that controls the drive tires to slow the train down. I'm not sure if the California's Great America model has that feature, but I do know for a fact that they park theirs going as it comes down backwards. That's something we are not able to do at Kennywood due to how we are supposed to run our rides. Um and to increase longevity of that attraction we aren't able to run it backwards but we are actually able to technically be able to run the curve backwards it's just we are a not allowed and b it would be running very very slowly like the berserker at california's great america uh no offense to you guys i were just very glad that you still even have a baron curve model um but at Kennywood, we do have that foot pedal, and that gives the operator a lot more control over how they're supposed to park the cars. And parking the cars is actually something that takes a lot of practice. I know for me personally, it took me about three hours uh, cumulative uh, for me to learn the curve and get signed off for the operation. Um, I can definitely say, though, it's easily my favorite ride to operate at the park. It's even my probably my favorite flat ride in general. Um, not only just how it looks, but how it rides and, like I said, operating. Wow. Now I wish I would have rode it. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> awesome, though. Seriously. Sounds like an awesome ride. And then moving on yeah. to the competition, we have Chance Rides, which created their own model called the Olympic Bobs in 1968. Uh, only one was ever made, and it was made as a traveling unit. The Olympic Bobs were hydraulically driven, unlike the Schwarzkopf manufactured by Byron Curves, sorry, uh, which were electrically driven. And then on to a few other facts. Some older models of the Byron Curve, like the original one at Kennywood, actually allowed for three riders in a bobsleigh using the inline seating uh, configuration. In 1989, the Metroliner debuted at Wiesberg in Sweden. This ride was made by BHS, which worked together with Schwarzkopf a lot. Uh, the Metroliner was based off a concept from Schwarzkopf called the Superbop, which was basically a double buy-in curve. The Metroliner was only built once and operated in Wiesberg from 1989 until 1992. And then it was moved to Hansa Park where it operated from 1993 until 2015. And then from 2015 until 2017, it operated at Skyline Park, and then it sadly got scrapped. Uh, later on, starting in 1975, Schwarzkopf designed a new ride entitled the Alpen Blitz. This ride would end up being an expanded version of the Baron Curve and is considered an actual coaster unlike the Baron Curve. In 1976, Six Flags Great Adventure actually acquired one of the Alpen Blitz models to replace their Schwarzkopf Jumbo Jet Coaster. Only one of these attractions remain, but the most notable still standing is uh, at Queensland in Chennai, Tamil Nadu, India. Please <laughs> pardon me if I pronounce that wrong. Uh, Schwarzkopf made two of these models of the Alpen Blitz, being the Alpen Blitz 1 and the Alpen Blitz 2. There were only ever one Alpenblitz 1 model, which was made as a traveling model entitled Cresta, but in 1976, the model was recreated and designed as the Alpenblitz 2, which was the model that surfs in the parks. Only nine Alpenblitz 2s were ever erected. All right, well, we've reached the end of our script here, so uh, these guys have a lot to say about these particular rides, so I'm going to let them talk about it there's a lot to say a lot to learn about these rides and i am learning along with them well with you guys um 
One thing I would like to note is that actually at Kennywood, we've had multiple models uh, dating even back to 1968, uh, where our first one actually did have all the decorations, such as the watchtower, where there would be two kids bobbing out, watching the ride as it goes along. Uh, the Olympic rings in the middle. We also had uh, the lights across where the spectators were. And the spectators were a different fiberglass uh, structure. After that one, we then got another model in the 80s. And in 1994, we acquired the Miracle Strip uh, curve model that they had down in Florida once Miracle Strip Amusement Park closed. That's the one we've been using ever since 1994. One thing I would like to note, though, is, as I said before about the rails and the trolley pickup, that's how the Berserker one is constructed over at California's Great America. Uh, they don't actually run with that middle cone where the electricity would be sent to the cars and the rail along a cable theirs actually still has the rail pickup and the trolley pickup uh as the ride goes along that's how a lot of the fairground ones are constructed and that's why those have a bit of a more difficult time staying reliable as that the electric cable is the one thing that keeps ours up and running and I believe it's most likely the reason that California Great America's Berserker runs just a little bit slower. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, these things are, they were so common and now there's like two left and one is in pretty bad shape. Um, so I guess we can work on concluding this video here. So if you are in the U.S., do go to Kennywood and try to say hi to Luke, I guess, and uh, definitely ride the Byron Curve, Barron Curve. Bay and Curve, however you want to pronounce it. Definitely would recommend going. I know I missed out on it last year. That was dumb of me. Um, Alex, do you have anything else you would like to, to add on to this? Well, yeah. I have personally been on four of them. Sadly, two of them are gone by now. But, well, there's still two of them operating and traveling. One in France, and this one is absolutely beautiful. It has all the lights possible, it has all the decorations possible, and it's just a masterpiece. It's beautiful. It's maintained perfectly. It's if you ever if you're ever in France and just search for fairs that has the Bayern curve from uh Bozek, if I'm not wrong. The that's the showman that travel with it. And they maintain it so well. It's beautiful. It looks as good as new. And it's so impressive to still to see such a rare ride in such a good condition and i absolutely love that one and i cannot wait to see it again and ride it again quickly i would actually we, uh, very fast quickly can we touch on the speed of the byron kirk i think we mentioned that and it's pretty interesting i think what, what did you yeah, say well, though, the one article said it, it can go like some, um, like Schwarzkopf Coaster Net, for example, says that the maximum speed of the Bayern Curve is 120 kilometers per hour or 74 miles per hour. Which and is definitely not true. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no. I don't believe it. It's. I mean, these rides are from the 60s, as I believe one of you said, so they're, they're not going to be traveling as fast as a modern flatter coaster. Not even, not, I mean, that's just so incredibly fast. Um, I don't know if you wanted to mention what Kennywood's one runs at. I don't know if you, you uh, have yeah. That. So the Kennywood model, uh, it ran its fastest back whenever we reinstalled it in 2009, to where it was running around 40 ish miles per hour. But as of now, it's been slowed down to increase longevity of the attraction uh, to about 35, uh, roughly speaking. Uh, that's more on the good days whenever it's all greased up and uh, hot out. Some days, most of the days, it's still running at at least 30 miles per hour. And I and even like to note, because I've seen on Wikipedia too before that you know 74 mile per hour fact, 120 kilometer. Um, 
if if that actually does exist, I really want to ride that mm-hmm. because I mean, ours is already extremely fast as is. Um, yeah, you because know, the track length it's only about sixty nine feet wide, uh, so it's not like there's a real big uh, amount of space for this to even be traveling. And if it were to travel that fast, that would be mind boggling. <laughs> Yeah, I don't believe the track can handle such a fast speed. Yeah, and I don't think it can either, just due to the fact of if it's even the fairground ones that are doing that, (laughs) uh, that's a lot of wear and tear on the trolley pickup uh, underneath each of the cars. All right, is there anything else you want to tack on to the end of this? No. (laughs) Not, not, not that I know of at the moment, no. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for the little bit of a longer episode here. Uh, I hope everyone watching enjoyed this, and we'll see you all next week. Bye.